sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. I would like to wish you a Merry Christmas, and I would also like to thank you for joining us this week for our online service. If you're watching from across Four Corners, Florida, we invite you to come out every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the gymnasium of Citrus Ridge Academy. Citrus Ridge Academy is just off of Highway 27 on Sand Mine Road, and we look forward to meeting you there. Now I'd like to invite you to join in with us as we sing a great Christmas carol. Thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to worship you. I thank you for the joy that we have in you and in your salvation. And God, I pray today as we look into your word that you would speak to our hearts. Help us to receive your truth with joy today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I would like to welcome you to our fourth and final week in a study and the events surrounding the Incarnation. Now, the Incarnation is a big deal. It's a big deal for the Christian faith because the virgin birth is critical. It's a critical doctrine that we must uphold. See, Jesus being God was not born with a sin nature like you and like me. That, in that way, he could die for our sins because he wouldn't have to die for his own. But Jesus becoming a man is also very important. God taking on flesh, because in that way, he could purchase our redemption 
with his blood. So the incarnation, the virgin birth, is a very critical doctrine of the Christian faith. And I believe it's too big of an event for just us to limit our celebration to one calendar day out of the year. And that's why we've been looking at the events surrounding the incarnation. Now, this is our fourth week. Now, even though the Christmas story is not found in the Gospel of John, the, the Gospel of John contains some very important truth about Jesus and the Incarnation. And the reason why we're going to look at this vital information from the first chapter of John today is because if we get it wrong about Jesus, it really doesn't matter what we get right when it comes to our theology. Because getting Jesus right is important. John chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 tells us some things about the Messiah, some things about Jesus. It says this, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. Now that tells us something very important about Jesus. That Jesus is, is God. He has no beginning and no end. It's hard for us to wrap our human minds around the concept of an eternal being. But Jesus existed before he was born in a manger. He existed before he added humanity to his deity. And I can't tell you how many people I've come across that were shocked to hear me say that Jesus is pre-existent, that, that he is eternal. Because so many people believe that Jesus just began in the manger, in the Christmas story, at the Incarnation. But the Word of God tells us that He existed before that. Let's continue. It says this, In the beginning the Word already existed, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. It's another very important thing about Jesus. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a good human being. There's been other good human beings that had great lessons throughout the history of mankind. Jesus is different from all of them because Jesus is God. He is God and He is man. John 1 verse 3 says, God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. This is a very important fact about Jesus. Because Jesus was present at and an active contributor in the creation that you and I live in. In the material creation of this universe. Hey, Jesus was present and active in the creation. Even in the Old Testament, in Genesis, we find the, the words where God is talking with himself and he says, let us make man in our own image. The Father was there. The Word, Jesus, was there. The Holy Spirit was there. God was there. In verse 4 of John chapter 1, it says, The Word gave life to everything that was created. Now, this is still talking about Jesus. It's still talking about the baby in a manger. It's, it's talking about the eternal Son of God. And the Word, Jesus, is the one who gave life to everything that was created. And that tells us something about Jesus, that Jesus is life. He gives life. He is life. He gives physical life to all of creation. He offers spiritual life to humanity, and He offers eternal life to those who will put their faith and trust in Him and believe in Him and call on Him to be their Lord. Jesus is life. Back to verse 4, it says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never 
extinguish it. Now, Jesus is not only life. Jesus is light. Jesus is light. And you know what? <clears throat> Darkness can never overpower light. Light always overpowers darkness and overcomes darkness. Here's some things about light that we can look into and understand when we see that Jesus is light and his life gave light. Light, what does it do for you and for me? It enables vision. It gives direction. Light extinguishes fear. And light dispels darkness. Jesus is light. Now, in every culture all around the world, whether we can speak the language or not, giving gifts is an expression of love. It's an expression of friendship. And the incarnation and Christmas, is, it's about God's gift to us. His gift of love his demonstration of love for you and for me. John 3, 16, probably one of the most memorized verses in all of Scripture, tells us this, For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. See, the demonstration of God's love was the incarnation. His eternal son stepping down out of the eternal throne room of everything, of, e of, of eternity, even beyond the creation. He stepped down and added humanity to his deity so that he could offer you and me his gift of eternal life. Now, some people have a difficult time believing the real story of Christmas. They refuse to accept the miracle of the virgin birth, even though I've told you how critical it is to the Christian faith. See, some people just don't understand the importance or the purpose of a virgin birth or of the incarnation. And it's been years now, but I've heard this story probably for, I don't know, 30 years of my life, and I want to share it with you just in case you're not familiar with it. There was a man who used to be on the radio named Paul Harvey. And he adopted this story as his personal Christmas story. He didn't write it, but he could not find the origin of the story. But the story is called A Man and the Birds. And the story goes like this. One day, of, it was Christmas Eve, late at night, and the family was going to go to the church service where they were going to have communion together on Christmas Eve. But the husband said, you know, I just, I just can't believe in this virgin birth thing. And I really, you know, I, I think it's just stretching it too much. I don't think it's possible. So you and the kids, you just go on to church and I'll stay here at home. Well, it began to snow as the family went to church and left. All of a sudden it began to snow and it was snowing very hard and the temperature was dropping drastically. And as the man sat in his living room on the couch, all of a sudden he heard a thumping noise. He turned around to look and he, he's like, surely I didn't accidentally lock the door. My family's locked outside. So he went, opened up the door. He came back. He sat back down. What, where's this thumping noise coming from? And then he heard it again and again. And he turned around and looked and the window of the living room, he saw what was going on. He, he saw that some birds were flying into the window. They were seeing, I guess, seeing the warmth. They're feeling the warmth and seeing the fire and the light. And they were trying to get out of the cold and they were bumping into the window. So he, he went outside and he, he shoot them off the porch and then he went back in and then they were there again. And he's like, these birds want to get out of this severe weather. So he had an idea. He had a barn outside with a big door on the front of it. He walked outside and he opened up the door and he tried to get the birds to go into the barn so that they would be sheltered from the storm. But the more he tried, 
the more frustrated he became. I mean, he tried shooing the birds in. He tried putting breadcrumbs out and leading a path into the safety of the barn. But the birds, every time he got around them, they would just fly and flutter and, and they were scared of him. And then a thought came to his mind. And the thought was this, if only I could become a bird, then I could communicate with these birds and I could tell them that I'm not trying to hurt them, I'm trying to help them. And then I could lead them safely into the security of the barn out of the storm. About that time when that thought hit his head, all of a sudden the church bells began to ring and the man fell to his knees in the snow. And that was Paul Harvey's story to let us know that, you know, that man came to the conclusion that if he could become a bird, then he could communicate with those birds and show them to safety. And that's a wonderful picture of the incarnation. God becoming man and Jesus showing you and me and offering you and me the way of salvation. As we conclude our service, I want us to share in communion together. And if you're watching this from home, you can, you can pause the video right now and go get some juice and some bread and then come back and join us. John 1, verses 10 through 14, tells us this about Jesus. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. See, Jesus took on flesh. And as we share communion together, we use, we use bread to represent his flesh. And on the night before he went through his trial and crucifixion, Jesus gathered with his disciples, those, those men that had been with him for over three years and they had walked with him and he was going to entrust the mission to them after he died on the cross. And he got together with them and had a communion. He had a Lord's Supper with them. And he held up the bread and he said, this bread represents my body, my flesh, which is, which is broken for you. See, ultimately the incarnation is a demonstration of God's love and Jesus took on flesh. He added humanity to his divine nature so he could willingly lay his life down for you. And he was broken for, for you and for me. He was beaten and broken. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, it says, and when Jesus had given thanks. So let's, let's pause and thank him. Can we do that? Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for taking on flesh and becoming a man so that you could be a representative for us and, and a substitute for us and stand in our place. And thank you for taking on flesh for us. And the scripture says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now Jesus took on flesh and became man. But that night when he was with his disciples, he 
asks them after taking of the bread, he asks them to drink from the cup. The bread represented his flesh and his body, and the cup represented his blood. Because his blood made it possible for you and for me to be under a new covenant, new covenant with God. See, the ultimate purpose of the incarnation was the cross. Jesus demonstrated his love for you by shedding his blood, by becoming the perfect sacrifice for the remission and forgiveness of your sin and my sin. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And Jesus shed his blood for you and for me. And that night with his disciples in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, it says this, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for all that you purchased with your blood. Thank you that you purchased our forgiveness. Thank you for the great substitution that we can trade our sin for your righteousness. Jesus, thank you for the incarnation. And thank you for your death and your burial and your resurrection that guarantees our resurrection one day to be resurrected to spend eternity with you and in your presence. Thank you. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us this week here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. If today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? All you have to do is hit that share button right under the video. In doing that, you'll be coming alongside of us in our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.